Hello and welcome to the third lecture in my new series entitled Understanding Science. If you haven't already done so, I strongly suggest that you go back and watch the first two lectures in this series on the subjects of proof and Bayes' theorem. The lectures are designed to be seen in order and each one will build on knowledge from earlier lectures, so you may not get the most out of this one if you watch it without the foundation that I build up in the earlier sessions. In this third lecture, I'm going to approach the concept of the scientific method. The scientific method is the process by which science actually works. I spent two lectures talking about the theoretical fundamentals, but let's now look at how they actually work in practice. The way I'm going to do this is to go over the way the scientific method works, and then at each stage I'll look at why we do the things that way and what might happen if we didn't. So let's get started. There's a common misconception that the scientific method is just an arbitrary set of procedures that scientists have mutually agreed upon amongst themselves and have then decided to write down in stone. This lecture is all about why that view is wrong and I'm going to introduce the concept of the scientific method as the optimal procedure, continually tweaked and improved over centuries, for rooting out the answer to any empirical question. So what's the point of the scientific method? How does it work? And why do we even need to define a method for finding out how the world works? To some people that may not seem like a sensible question, but it really is. Why do we need a method to find stuff out? We've mostly lived our lives so far without any kind of method, and we've all learned a huge number of things. Well, yes and no. Yes, you have learned a lot of pieces of information in your lives. Even the youngest listeners to this lecture will already have learned a staggering amount of knowledge about the world, about their environment, about the laws of nature, about language, and so on. And you can be reasonably sure that most of it's correct. After all, if this lecture is making any sense to you at all, then that probably means you've mastered the language of English, either as a baby or perhaps as a second language later on in life. So how did you pick up all this information? It's tempting to say that you learned it all by a random process of interacting with the world, which is partly true. But it's also true to say that a lot of what you know is probably wrong. Not just you, of course, but all of us. The human mind has evolved to perform a number of feats extraordinarily well, but determining the truth in all circumstances isn't exactly an overriding demand. There are times, of course, when it's great to know whether it's likely to rain or shine, whether clouds are likely to develop into a storm, whether a distant roar of thunder was actually thunder or was it the battle cry of an approaching army. But knowing the precise nature of the water cycle, the way clouds are formed, the physics of storms, that's not exactly important for our survival. So our brains have been exquisitely tuned to recognise patterns which allow us to learn and to recognise the finest details in nature and in our own lives. But when the questions extend beyond immediate consequences to us and start probing the larger questions, then our brains really aren't equipped to cope. After all, you probably all know that the Sun is a huge ball of gas, roughly a million times the size of the Earth, an extraordinarily long distance away, 150 million kilometres to be precise. But tell me, how do you know those facts? Is that obvious to you? Would your first instinct have been to assume that the Sun is a self-gravitating spherical body of primarily hydrogen gas 1.4 million kilometres across, undergoing nuclear fusion at temperatures of millions of degrees? Or would your first assumption have been to assume it's some sort of giant fire in the sky, perhaps a flaming god riding a blazing chariot? The ancient civilizations who believed the latter were not less intelligent than us, they just didn't have science to rely on. They had no process for investigating physical claims. And, to be fair on them, they didn't have the wherewithal to go out and make the measurements needed to arrive at these conclusions. You see, it's not at all obvious that intuitions are unreliable. After all, they basically only ever fail in cases where the truth is actually not readily knowable. For everyday questions, does this person look kind or aggressive? Does that farmer own more sheep than I do? Is it going to rain later today? Is that king's army bigger than mine? For these kinds of questions, intuition is remarkably accurate, at least to the degree we require, and the human brain is extraordinarily good at explaining away the times in which intuition is poor. So the ancient Greeks, Egyptians and Romans were not at a disadvantage in thinking that the sun was a giant fire god arcing through the heavens in a chariot, or whatever other pictures they conjured up. Their model predicted the sun's behaviour just as well as ours does, at least to the precision that they cared about, and more importantly, there was nobody around to correct them. So as far as they were concerned, they were right. And we can't even say that they ignored Occam's razor. If you remember that from Lecture 1, this is the law that says that we shouldn't invent extra complexity where none is required. Because as far as they were concerned, a giant god in the sky was both plausible and accurate as an explanation, and the thought of an unfathomably huge ball of self-gravitating hydrogen would have sounded as daft to them as a charioteering sun god sounds to us. <laughs> 
I think my point here is this. You may believe that you gathered a huge amount of information without any real method to guide you, and that's probably partly true, but only because you've relied on heuristics that have provided you with certainty instead. For example, if a teacher says it, it's true, or if my parents tell me it's true, or even my personal favourite, if the tabloids say it, it's probably false. And those are probably pretty good rules to live by, especially the last one, but you're essentially just piggybacking on someone else's method. If your teacher told you that gravity was an inverse square law of attraction, it's probably because their teachers told them, and their teachers told them, and so on, back to Isaac Newton, who actually did the work to come up with the theory of gravitation in the first place. And then the numerous scientists since Isaac Newton who have tested and verified his theory more rigorously have passed on that knowledge. You have to have a method to gain new knowledge, whether you admit it or are aware of it or not, because a method gives you three things, without which no progress can be made. It gives you a way of generating plausible models about the universe. It gives you a way of testing those models. And it gives you a way of deciding which models to accept and which to reject, given the tests you've performed. And if your method for, say, investigating the nature of the solar system is believe anything I'm told, or guess randomly, or listen to what an ancient text says, or even go with what my gut tells me, then you'll probably come up with models that are at least superficially plausible but you're also pretty much guaranteed to be wrong. And worse than that, you have no way of checking whether or not you're wrong, which is the most dangerous thing of all. So we need a method to investigate the laws of nature. Think of it as a toolbox to dig into the workings of the universe. And scientists and philosophers have attacked this problem for centuries, attempting to come up with the most accurate and efficient and effective set of tools possible, so that we can carry out this investigation and build up an edifice of knowledge for all humankind. And what they've come up with is called the scientific method. Let's list the steps that the scientific method prescribes in order for us to investigate a topic. Step 1. Define a question. It may seem like an obvious first step, but if we don't carefully describe the problem that we're investigating, how will we know where to look? And how will we know when we've got an answer? Step 2. Form hypotheses. In order to investigate how a question might be resolved, we ought to come up with a list of ideas, as many as possible, though constrained by some measure of plausibility. Then we can find some way of determining between them. Step 3. Perform experiments. Next we need to conduct experiments or gather data, which will help us to determine which of our hypotheses is the most probable. Step 4. Analyse the data. It's important to analyse our data in a way that mitigates the various problems that I've touched on regarding our innate human fallibility and tendency towards bias and prejudice. After all, we need to find out what's true, not what we want to be true. Step 5. Interpret the data. We need to interpret the data that we've discovered and see how strongly they confirm or disconfirm the hypotheses that we're investigating. Step 6. Peer review. Now this is a really important step. It's absolutely vital that we don't just rely on our own brains to spot the errors in our own work. Just like when you've spell-checked a document you're writing a dozen times and you send it to someone only for them to spot a number of typos that you must have looked at and completely missed several times over. Peer review is the process of getting other experts to check our work. Step 7. Repeat the experiment. The scientific process is a continually improving process and it doesn't deal in solid, unquestionable dogmas. In this way, it's important that others should be able to replicate any work that we do in order to rule out fluke results. And finally, Step 8 continual review. Not only should others be encouraged to replicate and verify our results, but they should continue to do so as long as our theory stands. Otherwise the danger is that previously well-supported theories might not stand up to increasingly accurate or perceptive experimental methods as technology improves, but if we just assume that they're correct and never go back to test them, then we might never know. This final step is something that often gets missed in lists such as this one, and moreover it's one of the major differences between science and pseudoscience or something that looks like science but isn't really. In science, theories are always up for review. We have no dogmas and no pronouncements from authority. Now, there are some theories, like relativity and evolution, that are so well attested by experimental and theoretical evidence that it would be almost impossible to imagine how they could be wrong. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't investigate claims against them when done in a rigorous scientific manner. Though if you remember last lecture on Bayes' theorem, you should definitely go into such an investigation aware of the weight of evidence that already rests on the side of the balance, the prior, and remember that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Finally, I would be dishonest if I didn't touch on some of the more serious criticisms of the scientific method, 
most importantly from 20th century philosophers such as Thomas Kuhn and Paul Feyerabend. So I'll complete this lecture with a brief overview of what some members of the more anarchic side of philosophy have said against the scientific method. So let's begin by looking at all of these steps one at a time. The first step to any scientific investigation is obviously going to be to work out what it is that we actually want to discover. And there are a few guidelines that we must follow here in order for this to qualify as a meaningful question. So what do I mean by a meaningful question? Can't science answer any kind of question? Well, not really, and for very good reason. In fact, I think, and this is just my list, but I don't think it's very controversial, I think that there are roughly five criteria that a good question should have. So let me explain those, and let me show you why any question that doesn't satisfy these criteria can't really be answered by scientific investigation. Firstly, a question should be specific. By this, I mean that we should ask a question that can be well-defined, so that we know what we're looking for, and we know at least vaguely where to look for the answers. So, for example, the question, what is the distance to the moon, is a good scientific question, and one that we could begin to investigate. However, existential or moral questions, such as, what is the meaning of life, or is it always wrong to lie, are not good scientific questions, because they contain terms that aren't well-defined. The meaning of life is not a well-defined term. It's not clear to me what the question is asking or how we might investigate it. And moral questions always fall down because of the fundamental difficulty of not knowing what the benchmark should be. Right and wrong are not scientific terms. Unless, of course, you define some scale against which you can measure them. But that always seems to lead to disagreement too. This leads us on to the next point. A scientific question should be measurable. If we can't measure anything related to the question, then we have no way of applying an empirical method, like science, to solving it. So once again, moral questions usually fall down here because we don't have a scale of right and wrong against which we can measure deeds. Similar problems happen when we attempt to answer questions like what's the best way to travel from London to Paris? Well, this isn't measurable either because we haven't defined what criteria we're using to evaluate how good a journey is. It might be the minimum distance, or the quickest, or the cheapest cost. Or alternatively, it might be the most scenic, or the safest, or the one with the lowest CO2 emissions. Once we define the criteria against which we're measuring the journey, then this becomes a scientific question, but until then it's essentially meaningless, at least as far as science is concerned. Thirdly, our question should be objective. By that I mean that it should be something that's not only measurable, but is measurable by a third party and doesn't rely on personal experience. For example, does celery taste awful? is not an objective question, because it relies on personal opinion. Similarly, are spiders scary? is a personal opinion, though the related question, am I scared by spiders, could be answered by science, because we could measure specific physiological responses that a person creates when confronted with a tarantula, say. Fourthly, a question should be meaningful. I guess this one stands to reason. There's no point answering nonsense questions. But just what constitutes a nonsense question is up for some debate. The 20th century philosopher A.J. Iyer wrote the foundational book on this subject, entitled Language, Truth and Logic in which he set out his idea that a question is only meaningful if it is at least conceivably verifiable. This comes largely under the measurable section. After all, the question of whether undetectable ghosts exist is surely a meaningless question to ask, because no measurement could ever conceivably determine one way or the other. But also, we should discard questions that contain unreasonable alternatives, such as, do giants live in my garden or have the dragons scared them all off? Of course, this question constrains our investigation too much. On that note, fifthly and finally, a question should be open. By this, I mean that we shouldn't code presuppositions into our question that restrict the scope of the answer. An example was the one just given about giants and dragons, but we could also include topics like how do the aliens create crop circles, which assumes that aliens exist and created crop circles in the first place. Or more down-to-earth examples such as why did the CIA assassinate President Kennedy, or the creationist's old favourite, why is the Earth less than 10,000 years old and how can we prove it? This kind of trick is often used by conspiracy theorists, as you might have gathered. Finally, in this section there is one common assumption that is made, traditionally by those attempting to defend supernatural viewpoints, that science cannot approach supernatural questions. Of course, this is clearly wrong, as you can see by looking at the list above. If I were to ask the question, is this man capable of communicating with the dead? Then this is a perfectly reasonable scientific question. You probably wouldn't get much traction applying for funding for it, but the question obeys the rules on this slide. It's specific and measurable. It is objective, 
we're not just relying on the medium say so, we're actually going to find some way of detecting whether or not the medium has gained some verifiable information from the other side. It's meaningful. Although science denies the possibility of the supernatural, hence the name supernatural or outside of nature, that doesn't mean it's not a reasonable question to ask. And finally, it's an open question, not assuming any specific answer. So, although it's a question about supernatural events, it's possible to word it in a scientific way. That's because of a phrase that you will often hear, that science is only methodologically naturalistic, meaning that scientific investigations are constrained to measuring physical events that we can detect with our senses and our apparatus, but that doesn't stop us from making investigations of phenomena whose causes may lie outside of nature. Right, so we set up our question, which is step one. Let's move on to step two. Step two is to form hypotheses. This is an important stage in the scientific process because it is here that we define the parameters of our search and we determine how we might empirically investigate the question that we've formed. Sometimes hypotheses are required as potential explanations for a phenomenon that we have witnessed. For example, what is the cause of gamma ray bursts, which is an astronomical phenomenon? Or what is the nature of dark matter? Both of which have proved very interesting questions in astronomy and cosmology over the last few decades. Here we are interested in listing potential answers so that we can start thinking about how we might distinguish between them. For example, let's look at dark matter. Dark matter is the substance that scientists discovered in the 1930s by investigating the way galaxies rotate in their outer parts. They discovered that stars a long way out from the centre of the galaxy were moving much faster than the existing laws of physics could explain. They realised that the reason for this was that there was an unknown and invisible form of matter in the outer parts of galaxies that was gravitationally attracting the stars and hence accelerating them more strongly. And because it couldn't be seen with telescopes, unlike the stars and dust that make up much of the visible components of galaxies, they dubbed it dark matter. Now, a very good question, still unresolved as I write this lecture, is what is dark matter? At this point, scientists have to form a set of hypotheses that allow them to investigate the problem. For example, perhaps dark matter is composed of a new kind of elementary particle that we haven't yet discovered, so maybe it's a very large number of very small things. Or perhaps it's composed of dead planets or objects the size of a star, but which are for some reason not shining in a way that we can detect. Or maybe it's composed of supermassive objects like giant black holes roaming in the depths of space. Well, each of these hypotheses is at least superficially plausible, and once we've made such a list, we can start working out what properties such matter might have so that we can go and look for it in whatever way is most suitable. For example, if the dark matter is composed of large dead stars, then we should occasionally see one of these objects pass between us and another star in the galaxy, and hence we should observe the light from that more distant star dim slightly. We could work out how often this should happen and how much the dimming rate should be based on how large the objects are and how many of them there are. And then we can go out and look for such dimming events and see if they occur. That's an example of how we could form hypotheses and use them to guide our investigation. But there are other types of scientific question here that we could be looking into. For example, the question that I asked earlier, how far away is the moon? Well, there are no unknown phenomena here to be investigated. This is just a straightforward measurement question. But we still need to narrow down the range that we're looking at. For example, is the moon a few hundred kilometres away? Is it hundreds of thousands of kilometres away? Is it light years away? Depending on the answers to those questions, we could attempt to use different methods to measure its distance. So how do we do that measurement? Let's move on to stage three. So now we know the question we want to answer, and we have a few hypotheses that we want to investigate. Now we need to actually go out and do that investigation. I'm simplifying here, of course. Often the investigation begins with a pen and paper or a computer, attempting to pare down the possible hypotheses with maths and logic rather than wasting time and money going out and attempting to measure something that couldn't possibly be detected. For example, in the case of dark matter, I suggested that we could look for dead stars as a potential explanation for dark matter by looking for events where a dead star eclipses a shining star behind it. So what we would have to do is work out how many dead stars we expect to see based on the mass of dark matter that we need to explain. Then we need some plausible model for how they could move around the galaxy and measurements of the density of stars so that we could estimate the likelihood of measuring such an event. Now it may turn out that the answer is that if we watch a few hundred stars we should see such an event every day or two. Or it might be that we would have to wait a million years to see one. If it's the latter then we would have to go back to the drawing board and think of a different way to investigate it. But once we've done a back of the envelope calculation, that is a quick and dirty calculation with rough estimates, we can then make sure that our experiment is plausible. 
and we set up the constraints to the experiment to make sure it deliver the results that we want. What should we look at? With what? For how long? If we expect one event every few days, then we need to observe for quite a long time, whereas if we expect one event every few seconds, then we should only need to look for a short while. Statistics come into play here. It's important not only that we measure an effect that helps us to investigate our question, but it's also important that the result that we come up with is statistically significant. More about that in the next slide, but for now, if we expect events to happen every few days, we observe for three hours and see nothing, it doesn't make sense to conclude that such events don't happen. In that short time, we wouldn't expect to see any events. However, if we go and look for a month or two and still haven't seen a single event, then clearly this is beginning to weigh heavily on one side of the balance. We also need to consider bias in our methods. Astronomers are lucky because they are measuring impersonal astronomical objects. They don't have to worry about the stars and planets lying to them. Social scientists, medical researchers and psychologists all have to worry about the human element to their studies. They need to make sure that they don't unconsciously influence the subjects to choose an action that they wouldn't have otherwise taken. And medical studies are always full of complex issues surrounding the placebo effect and the difficulties of measuring subjective experiences like pain reduction or happiness. But astronomers do have another bias to contend with due to the fact that they can't control the experiments they do completely. The universe is an astronomer's laboratory and all you can do is sit back and measure what it throws at you. You can't actually set up the experiment yourself, so to speak. So with our experiment that we laid out above, with the dark matter, we might want to be careful exactly how we perform our observations. For example, if we look at a part of a galaxy with an unusually high number of stars, we would expect an unusually high number of events, and vice versa. And we need to make sure that our apparatus is innately reliable too. Lastly, the results of our experiments need to be unambiguous. For example, in our dark matter experiment, we have to be careful to rule out the other causes of stars changing in brightness, such as stars with an innate variability that change in brightness on their own accord. We know that such stars exist, so we have to correct for that. We also need to be certain that the events we measure are unmistakably what we're looking for. For example, if the effect is very small, then it might be difficult to distinguish between an actual occultation of the kind we're looking for and noise in our telescope receiver or perhaps the effect of a large planet orbiting the star that we're investigating. So let's assume we've thought of all these things, and we've gathered our data. Now it's time to analyse it and see what we've got. Analysing data is one of those topics that's drier than most people can tolerate. Statistics is an incredibly tedious discipline, I'll admit, but it's one that's absolutely vital to the process of science. If we don't analyse our results in a rigorous way, then everything we've done so far is completely worthless or worse, might even be misleading. It might give us exactly the opposite answer to what we should be getting. When we're analysing our data, the question at the back of our minds should always be not just do our results agree with our hypothesis, but more importantly, do our results confirm our hypothesis? And there's a subtle difference that I'll explain. Let's say someone proposes to us that eating an apple a day stops you from catching a cold. And believe me, there are people claiming much crazier things than this who make millions of dollars from their efforts. Anyway, let's say we perform a trial to investigate this claim, and we eat an apple a day for a week, and we don't catch a cold. Well, this definitely agrees with the hypothesis that apples stave off colds, but it doesn't strongly confirm that hypothesis. Because in all likelihood, we wouldn't catch a cold in any week-long period anyway. What we need to do is look at how often people catch colds, statistically speaking, and conduct our experiment in such a way that we could say that we would expect a large number of colds in that period, and then see if we can detect any reduction. So let's say we take 100 people and ask them to eat an apple a day for an entire year. Most adults get a few colds every year, so out of those 100 people, let's say we calculate we would expect to record 300 colds during the year-long trial. If our apple-promoting claimant is correct, then we should observe a very substantial reduction in the number of colds. If apples completely prevent colds, then we should expect precisely zero colds, though usually in medicine we never expect dramatic results like this. In fact, this is a good rule of thumb whenever anyone suggests a fairly simple solution which should have dramatic results to a complex medical problem. A solution so simple that its effects would already have been observed if it were true. You should always try to find out what they're selling because you can guarantee that they're making money from it somehow and you should be extremely sceptical of any such claims. So, back to our study. Let's say that instead of the 300 colds we expect, we actually measure 295. That's less than 300, but does that confirm the hypothesis? What if we measure 310? Does that completely refute the hypothesis? Maybe apples cause colds. 
Well, this is where the maths comes in, and I won't go into the details, but we could plug in some numbers into a few well-known equations, and just based on random variation, we would expect the number of colds we measure to vary by at least a few dozen away from our expected value without raising our eyebrows at all. In fact, we could work out what figure we should expect in order to be confident that there is a real effect here. And this is always a matter of assessing what level of confidence you're comfortable with. But let's say we want a result of such significance that there's only half a percent chance that it could have happened randomly. That would be a strong result, and the maths tells us that we would want to look for a count of 255 colds or less. If the reduction is less dramatic than this, then it doesn't satisfy our requirements, and we conclude that the apple a day theory doesn't work. Of course, statistical significance isn't the whole story. We still have to think about bias when we're reducing our data. The golden standard for clinical trials in medicine is the randomised, placebo-controlled, double-blind trial. What does each of those terms imply? In well-designed medical trials, we randomly assign our subjects to the various groups that we're measuring, say, eating an apple a day and not eating any apples. We have a second group for people who are not eating apples at all, just to make sure that we have a good baseline for the number of colds we expect without using the proposed remedy. Often in drug trials, the best practice is to give one group of participants a placebo, that is, a completely ineffective medicine that looks like the real medicine, instead of the drug being tested. The reason for this is because we want to rule out the possibility that subjects are convincing themselves that the drugs are helping and misreporting their results. It's difficult to imagine a placebo apple, I'll admit, but let's say we could create something that looked and tasted just like an apple, but was in fact a totally different fruit. We would give half our people an apple a day, and the other half one of these fake apples. Then you get round the problems of people suffering very minor colds and deciding not to report it because they really want the trial to succeed. Or perhaps they want it to fail, so they report symptoms much more regularly than they would otherwise do, just so that they can sabotage the trial. However, if they don't know if they're taking the real apple or the fake apple, then they can't bias the results in this way. Or at least they can't bias the results differently based on whether they're eating real apples or placebos. This is called a double-blind trial. The patient is blind as to whether they're in the test group or the placebo group, and the experimenters should also be blind to this. They shouldn't know if they're giving each person real or fake apples, in case they give away some information with their body language. We randomly assign subjects to each group so that we don't accidentally introduce some bias into how we divide them up, such as putting apple lovers in one group and apple haters in the other. If we plan our trials in this way, then analysing the results should be much easier. OK, so we've analysed our results, but how do we interpret our findings? So, the randomised placebo-controlled double-blinded trial is great, but it needs two more things to be perfect. Firstly, it should be very large-scale. The larger the number of participants, the more statistically significant the outcome. And secondly, it should actually be triple-blinded. That is to say, the person doing the data analysis on the other end shouldn't know which group is which either. There's a wonderful example of this from the 1990s by a French scientist called Jacques Benveniste. He was attempting to prove the pseudoscientific belief of homeopathy that ultra-dilute substances can somehow retain some memory of chemicals that have been dissolved in them. He claimed to find results to show that this extraordinary claim was true, but as we now know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. A team of scientists and one magician, a man familiar with the way humans deceive themselves, went to observe his team at work, and they immediately realised that Benveniste's team were not blinded properly. They were aware whether they were analysing samples which had been exposed to homeopathic solutions or ones that hadn't. And they were of course introducing their own biases into the process when they were analysing the samples for evidence that the homeopathic substances might have caused some kind of effect. Once the experimenters were properly blinded, the effect vanished. Also, at this point you have to remember Bayes' theorem. Remember that the degree to which you should alter your opinion of the likelihood of a hypothesis depends on how strong your data are. You need to take into account two things the degree to which the data you gather agree with the predictions made by the hypothesis, and the degree to which they distinguish this hypothesis from other hypotheses. That is to say, you're looking for results that favour one possible explanation and do not favour the others. To this, of course, you add in your prior probability. If a hypothesis has a very strong prior, then even after mild disconfirmation, it might still be the best theory you have. The final thing I want to point out here is that sometimes someone can give you a set of absolutely undeniable high quality data and it can still be misleading. By definition, every 100 studies you would expect a 1 in 100 result to happen. The other 99 times you would expect nothing exciting to happen, probably, 
So if those 99 studies never get published, after all, nothing spectacular happened in any of them, but the one study with the unusual result does get published, then it will look utterly remarkable. But it will be incredibly misleading. Yes, there was a 1 in 100 result, but we've artificially removed the other 99 null results, making this single one stand out on its own. This is why companies are now forced to register drug trials so that all results, positive and negative, can be properly tracked. Another similar tactic is for a study to measure dozens of different outcomes in the hope that they get an unusual reading in one of them, and statistically speaking, if you measure enough things, one of them will probably give you a strong result, just by chance. And then that one gets reported and the others are conveniently forgotten. This is sometimes known as the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. After the man who fires a shotgun in a barn door walks over to the array of holes, draws a circle round them and says, see, I hit bang in the centre. You can't set your goals after the study has been performed. Again, companies are now not only forced to register trials beforehand, but they must also register the outcomes that they're measuring, so they can't play this trick. So we've looked in great detail at the scientific method, but there's one thing that we haven't really spent any time talking about, and that's the one thing we can't really control, the fact that the entire scientific process is implemented by human beings. And human beings, as you probably know, are prone to commit errors. And I mean all of us. There are many different kinds of errors that we could commit that will have a direct impact on the experiments we perform. It's important not only that we're aware of this, but that we design our experiments to control for as many of these as possible. But ultimately, there's only so much we can do. After all, if an experimenter misses a fundamental error in the design of an experiment, then all the careful measurements in the world won't help them, and the experiment will probably be worthless. Firstly, there's confirmation bias. I will probably do a whole lecture on logical fallacies at some point, but for now, let's just look at this one as it's probably the most important of all thinking errors. Confirmation bias is the psychological predisposition that all human beings have that guides us to notice and to remember those things that conform to our expectations and desires, and to ignore and forget those things that do not conform to our expectations and desires. So, for example, if you want to prove that the government is inept and worthless, then you can fairly easily find good examples to indicate that and those are going to be the ones that you remember the most clearly. Anyone who strongly supports the opposition probably will do exactly this. But they will equally well ignore or forget about the good things that the government's done, and moreover they will probably have exactly the reverse attitude towards the party they support. In science it's fair to say that individual researchers have agendas. They don't approach an experiment as a complete blank slate with no expectations about what they're going to find. Quite the contrary. In most experiments, a scientist has a pretty good idea what outcome they expect. This can be particularly dangerous for psychologists, where many of the measurements they're going to take can be far more subjective than in other sciences. If you're looking for indications that a certain person has a depressed attitude, say, then you can pay far more attention to actions that they commit that agree with your diagnosis and ignore or rationalise actions that don't. And that can bias the outcomes of your studies, unless you're very careful. Secondly, there are always measurement errors. Not just misreading a particular piece of apparatus, but perhaps even having faulty apparatus or using entirely the wrong apparatus to measure the effect that you're researching. Thirdly, there's methodological errors. By this I mean that the process a scientist follows might be flawed. For example, you're looking at the effects of a certain new pill on health and well-being, but you don't correctly control for other factors that might affect your subjects far more strongly, such as their general diet or exercise levels. Fourthly, there's always omissions. By this I mean that there's always things that you just forgot to measure, or forgot to check, or even worse, forget to document in your study despite the fact you have actually done them. For example, you might be measuring a certain kind of astronomical event and miss out details of the instrument that you used in order to observe the event, or the software you used to process the data, or the precise methods you used to perform that analysis. Without such information, it could be that your experiment is not reproducible at all. Fifthly, and finally, there's always ignorance. Nobody knows everything, and it might just be that, despite applying all the necessary rigour and honesty in designing your experiment, there's just something you didn't know about that renders it worthless. For example, you might be looking out for some kind of astronomical phenomenon with an optical telescope and fail to spot it, so conclude perhaps that it doesn't exist, but then a colleague might do some more calculations and discover that this phenomenon should only be visible in infrared or X-ray wavelengths, for example, so your failure to spot it in visible light actually means nothing. So that's the main sources of errors, and of course there are more, but happily there are also two things in our favour that help us to get round this situation. Firstly, all humans think slightly differently to each other, 
That may seem like a drawback, but actually it isn't. OK, so it means that some experimenters are likely to make errors that others won't make, but on the flip side it means that all experimenters don't make the same errors. If we all thought alike, then we would all fall for the same mistakes every time and we would never be able to spot them. But we don't all think alike, so sometimes scientists discover mistakes when they come to replicate an experiment that maybe nobody had even thought about before. Secondly, human beings are competitive and are in competition for a limited number of jobs, awards and accolades. Again, this may seem like a negative, but it really isn't, because it incentivizes scientists to criticise each other's work as much as possible. After all, if your main competitor for a prestigious role publishes something really important, and you can show that she made a huge error in her experimental design, then that certainly boosts your own standing in comparison. Of course, I'm making scientists sound cutthroat and Machiavellian, and I definitely don't think that. In fact, collaboration and cooperation are hugely important in science too. But there definitely are allegiances and antagonisms within the scientific community, and counterintuitively, that serves to make the findings of the scientific method more reliable. Peer review is great, and it's always worth getting your colleagues to read through what you've done in order to check for the obvious errors. But even after that, there are still going to be cases where all due caution was taken, methods were rigorous, yet the peer review process failed to pick up problems with your work, possibly because it was something that everyone was ignorant about. For example, in the 19th century, before doctors knew about germ theory, it was common for them not to wash their hands before treating patients. Entire studies could have been ruined because a certain doctor may have been studying his patients first thing in the morning, whereas another may have been examining them after visiting other patients with communicable diseases. Unsurprisingly, the second doctor would quite likely have seen a greater mortality rate in the patients he treated, which might have borne no relation whatsoever to the treatment under test. So, it's possible that there are, in the now immortal words of Donald Rumsfeld, unknown unknowns. That is, things that nobody is even aware about yet, but which affect the results of the experiments in ways that completely negate them. But what else could go wrong? Well, it's just possible that surprising experimental results might just be anomalies. After all, if a hundred experimenters perform studies of a process, then probably one of them will get a one in a hundred result. That one experimenter might publish that result as a startling new discovery, and the other 99 might not bother. So it would look like an incredible new find, but all that happened was a simple anomaly. Repeating that same experiment multiple times would be one way to discover whether or not that first result was a fluke, or whether it genuinely was a new discovery. After all, what science is attempting to do is to look for the underlying laws that govern how the universe behaves. And as you learned in the first lecture in this series, the underlying laws of the universe are fully expected to be repeatable and consistent. So provided we know all the variables that might affect the outcome of an experiment, we should expect the same result every time, plus or minus the expected level of randomness in the measurements, which will vary depending on what you're doing, of course. What this means is that experiments should be repeatable. A scientific paper should write up the techniques used in such a way that the experiment can be replicated by another sufficiently skilled scientist at a later date, and we expect the results to match. If they match, then that's another bit of weight in favour of the theory that the experiment supports. However, if the results come back differently a second time, then there's clearly something that we need to review in the techniques that we're using, or perhaps in the underlying laws that they're testing. Having said that, even if we try an experiment twice and get two different answers, we still don't know a great deal. After all, we don't know which, if either of the experiments, was correct. This is why it's important to replicate an experiment not once or twice, but as many times as possible. After all, every time you drop a massive object and it falls to Earth, you're essentially performing a test of Newton's law of gravity and his laws of motion. Every time you switch on a TV or a computer, you're performing numerous tests of all the various physical laws that have gone into the design of the electronic apparatus in question. So what could go wrong? Why might an experiment fail to replicate? Well, there's the obvious first possibility. Perhaps one of the experimenters made a mistake, or worse, lied. It does happen, which is why we must rely on thorough peer review and replication. But even with the best intentions, sometimes experimenters make mistakes. And as I said earlier, different people will probably make different mistakes, and hence it's likely that repeated attempts to replicate a result will also flush out any mistakes that might have been made. Maybe the result will hold, or maybe it won't. Different equipment can also cause problems, either because the original equipment might have been faulty or inaccurate, or perhaps just not adequate for the job. And then there's the analysis methods used. Two different mathematical approaches might arrive at totally different conclusions based on different assumptions or criteria. Perhaps the most memorable and instructive example of the importance of following the processes of peer review and replication is the infamous story of cold fusion. 
It was on the 23rd of March, 1989, when two chemists, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann, made a startling announcement that they had discovered a way in which they could harness the process of nuclear fusion, that's the process that happens within the core of our sun, but only at room temperature. This is known as cold fusion, and is one of the most sought-after goals in all of science, even though it's widely agreed to be impossible. That alone should have given Pons and Fleischmann pause for thought, but no, instead of going through the proper channels of peer review and replication, they went straight to the press and caused a media sensation with their claims. Of course, many other scientists then attempted to duplicate their miraculous experiment, almost all with the predictable null results. And eventually the scientific community was forced to conclude that Pons and Fleischmann's original experiment had been deeply flawed, and that they'd discovered nothing except for the willingness of the press to swallow up any sensational story they could find, with or without adequate proof. Ultimately, Pons and Fleischmann paid the price for their recklessness and their abandonment of scientific process not just by humiliating themselves, but by becoming the subjects of one of the most frequently retold cautionary tales in all of science. I can't remember whether or not I've said it before in this lecture series, but it's a mantra that I like to repeat often. Science does not dictate truths, it assigns probabilities. Science is not in the business of forcing everyone to believe in infallible dogma. As you learned in great depth during the first lecture, it's very rare indeed. Some might even say never that a scientific theory can be rejected or accepted with 100% confidence. Now often there are theories that we can reject with such overwhelmingly high confidence that to all human purposes it's certain, but often the verdicts we have to make are very much less clear-cut than this. This means something really important, and it's something that any decent scientist will tell you without hesitation. Scientific theories are always open to review, and that means by anyone. You don't need to have a Nobel Prize or a professorship to question a scientific theory. You don't even need a degree. Come to think of it, you don't even need to be out of kindergarten. The questioner is not important, it's the question that matters most. Everyone has the chance to test and update scientific theory, provided they follow the steps I've outlined in this lecture. Now, of course, it's almost always the case that in order to understand a scientific discipline well enough that you have a hope of fundamentally probing its most complex laws, you probably need to study it for rather a long time. Pretty much all pseudoscience and anti-scientific nonsense falls into the seductive trap of believing that the claimant is far more knowledgeable than he or she really is. That is to say, there's a very large body of scientific knowledge that's been built up carefully by the greatest minds in history, and which is currently being worked on by millions of the cleverest and most hard-working folk on the planet, some of whom have been studying their own individual specialist field for half a century or longer. There's no way that there are holes in the theories we're all researching that are so obvious they can be discovered by a layperson with no experience in the subject in a few minutes of casual thought and intuition. It always amuses me about creationists that they seem to think that holes in science so obvious that you can teach them to complete non-experts in 15 seconds might have been overlooked by experts who spent their entire lives working on the subject. So although science is open to criticism by anyone, and anyone can put forward the single piece of evidence that topples Einstein, that doesn't mean that all people are as likely to do so. There's a certain amount of due diligence that one must do first before one can really contribute usefully to any field, and that usually involves a good quality degree followed by a PhD, and often a fair amount of postdoctoral work too. And secondly, it's worth reminding you of the burden of proof in science. You can't topple a theory like gravity or evolution just by one observation. Those theories are far too secure and well attested. You would need overwhelming evidence, evidence so extraordinary that the likelihood of it being mistaken is smaller even than the likelihood that the theory it contradicts is wrong, given all the confirming evidence so far gathered in favour of the standing theory. But that's not to say that theories are never overturned. Sometimes they are, but it's very rare. The main example people always give in this case is that of Einstein's theory of relativity apparently proving Newton's laws of motion wrong. Well, yes and no. As I've said before, Newton's laws aren't really wrong, they're just an approximation to the true picture that holds true at human speeds and sizes. If you get very small, then you enter the quantum world where everything behaves differently. Similarly, as you approach the speed of light, relativity comes into play. How do we know this? Well, because we have far better equipment, better methods and different assumptions to those that were available to Newton in the 17th and 18th centuries. So it's ultimately very important that we continue to test and retest scientific theories, and to explore their range of validity, because you never know when you might discover something excitingly different. I hope I've shown in this lecture how the scientific method isn't perfect. 
After all, it's always going to be mitigated by the inherent problem of requiring human beings to run it. And this is exactly the point that several philosophers of science have picked up on in an attempt to show that the scientific method is really just a myth. It's a nice idea, but the real world operates very differently. In reality, there's a grain of truth in what they say, but as is usually the case, the most extreme voices are rarely correct. So it's worth taking some of their analyses with a bit of caution. We can learn from their ideas, but the real situation isn't anywhere near as pessimistic as some of them lead us to believe. The first person I want to discuss is Thomas Kuhn, an American philosopher whose principal contribution to this field was his 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. In this book, Kuhn argued that the standard picture of science progressing as a gradual accumulation of knowledge is in fact mistaken. That plays a part of the overall picture, of course, but misses the point that progress often happens in massive jumps, such as the discovery of the principle of relativity, which Kuhn dubbed paradigm shifts, a term which is now in wide use. The model that Kuhn proposed consists of three parts. In the normal science stage, which is very much like the model we've discussed so far, science does indeed progress steadily according to the prevailing models and paradigms that are in vogue at the time. But gradually, as this progress continues, results tend to accumulate that don't entirely tie in with the prevailing model and have to be either ignored or somehow twisted to fit in with the framework that is being used. But eventually this gets too much, and the whole underlying framework of science shifts to incorporate these new ideas in the stage known as revolutionary science. The third phase exists when there is no prevailing theory and the consensus tends to gravitate to certain theories based not so much on any overabundance of evidence on one side of the scales, but rather on the whims of individual scientists, human beings after all, who might hold certain subconscious preferences for certain models over others, or even for reasons as illogical as the charisma or lack thereof of the principal exponents of a certain model. So Kuhn's model of science isn't entirely critical. He merely folds in an understanding of the eccentricities of human psychology into the mix. And it's hard to disagree with his characterisation of the whole scientific discipline. After all, this does tend to be how science has progressed in the past. Though with the advent of the internet giving much more rapid and widespread publication of new ideas, it has become somewhat less accurate than it once was. It's much harder now to persist according to one framework when another more plausible one is available. In fact, if anything, we've shifted too far the other way, to popularist TV shows unduly praising minority viewpoints as if they are more plausible than they really are, and leading the public to believe that the consensus is shaky when often it isn't and doesn't need to be. The second viewpoint I wanted to mention in this slide is that of Paul Feyerabend, an Austrian-born philosopher of science who spent much of his adult life in the University of California at Berkeley, but seemed to travel around the world teaching at a wide range of major universities during his career which closely followed that of Kuhn and other names that I've already mentioned on this course, such as Karl Popper. Feyerabend was rather less constructive than Kuhn, and instead spent much energy attacking the process of science and sharing his disillusionment with the scientific method. In his 1975 book, Against Method, Feyerabend argued that there is no such thing as a universal scientific method, like the one that I've sketched out in this lecture. His argument was that not only is there no such method that is consistently used by all scientists, but moreover that there can be no such method. He argued that human factors, emotions, random chance, anarchy, are vital to scientific progress. New ideas rarely come from a rational analysis of past data, but usually involve a certain degree of human choice, aesthetic preference, or just good fortune. In short, the paradigm shifts that Kuhn discovered usually break the rules of science. Feyerabend went further, of course, claiming that scientific proof is merely an illusion and that the belief that scientific method should give us confidence in our theories is mistaken. He offered various historical examples, though the extent of his views in this regard are not shared by the majority of philosophers today, let alone scientists. Feyerabend famously claimed that the scientific community tends to be vastly overconfident of its own ideas, a claim that we should perhaps take seriously, but he went on to take the advice too far and for illustration suggested that the dismissal from the scientific community of pseudoscience and nonsense claims such as astrology and magical superstitions amounted to a bigoted dismissal of other viewpoints based on nothing more than elitism and arrogance. Feyerabend's view that science was little more than a cultural tradition is not one that meets with many advocates today. His arguments are often based on flawed views of the history of science in a way that's all too familiar with those of us who have been tasked with arguing against conspiracy theorists. Science adapts to new data, perhaps imperfectly, and perhaps slowly, and definitely at the whim of human emotion more than any of us would like to admit, but it does adapt, and the gross effect over time is that science moves in the right direction, towards an increasingly accurate picture of the universe, 
with theories that are able to predict an increasingly large number of phenomena, and which enable us to construct an increasingly elaborate but rigorous framework of knowledge. I'm going to have to conclude that criticism of science is a really valuable activity, of course. Science thrives on criticism because it is criticism that highlights flaws, and both Kuhn and Fair Arbend have pointed out something most important, which is that science is a process that requires humans to run it, and humans are imperfect. But the history of science also adequately proves that, with the right method, we can deal with a lot of these shortcomings and make staggering and world-changing progress. That's the end of this lecture, so let's just summarise what we've learned about the scientific method. The scientific method is a process that's been honed over time, centuries in fact, for a very important purpose. The rigorous and dependable gathering of knowledge. It has various properties which are vital to this process. Firstly, science is designed to minimise errors that may creep into our experiments. Secondly, it's designed to maximise the discovery of true information. That is to say, we discover as much as we can about the universe without compromising our standards of accuracy. Thirdly, science allows us to build coherent theories. A scientific theory is a very important building block of science as a whole. Theories are well tested, rigorously defined, based on extensive theoretical and practical investigation, built on coherent models, and potentially falsifiable, and make predictions about the state of the universe which allows us to test them and potentially to discard them if they fail those tests. Fourthly, the scientific method allows us to understand the weaknesses in our models and to continually strive to remove them. We do this in various ways, most notably by using accurate statistical techniques and procedures to assess the degree to which randomness and error may influence our results. We also use the techniques of Bayes' theorem, which allows us to assess the weight of evidence in favour and in opposition to a given idea. And finally, by using the technique of peer review, we ensure that we have as much space for criticism as possible, so that any potential issues are most likely to be discovered. Fifthly and finally, the scientific method allows us to improve on our knowledge in an iterative manner. By building theories, and by using those theories to predict further topics for investigation, the scientific method helps us to build an edifice of knowledge that we can use to solve real problems in our world. Sorry for the delay in posting this lecture. Things have been rather hectic at home, and, well, it took longer than I thought it might. I'll try to do the next one much more quickly, though I'm just deciding exactly what it should be about at the moment. In the meantime, I'll put the notes for this lecture up on my blog at frame.net, where you can also follow the other many and varied projects that I'm working on, and you can leave your comments and questions. In particular, if there's an aspect of science that you don't understand, then drop me a note, and I'll see if I can produce a presentation on that very topic. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.